going to work. Well, welcome, everyone. I'm uh, John Toole, uh, Executive Director and CEO of the Computer History Museum, and I want to welcome everybody to uh, the beginning of our, of our fall lecture series. And as you can see from the, uh, the slide, I think we have an incredible, power-packed, exciting fall season for you. Beginning this evening, I'm really honored to have Al Shugart here. So I want to say a few words about what's coming up and a little bit about the museum, and then I want to turn it over to Grant Severs, one of our trustees, uh, who will then say a few words and then introduce Al before he begins uh, the lecture this evening. But as you can tell, we've got quite a variety of activities coming up uh, from the lecture point of view. Mitch Waldrop, uh, September 19th, uh, author of one of the books that we've started in our, our e-store. And then we've got a tremendous series of venture capitalists on September 30th, the ones, the pioneers of venture capital. And it's going to be a great event. Uh, I hope you, everyone can be able to make it. And Chuck Geschke, John Warnock following, and Steve Wozniak on December 10th, the last few at Moffett Field. And of course, please mark on your calendars October 22nd. That's the Fellows Awards Banquet. We will honor four new fellows this year, and it's quite an event. Uh, four or five hundred people at the Fairmont Hotel in San Jose. Uh, we are really all about preserving the artifacts and stories of the information age. And if anyone here has not seen our visible storage area uh, currently in the little warehouse at, at Moffett Field, uh, please make an appointment to do so. It's really one of a kind, uh, one of a kind of experience. We probably have the best computer artifact collection in the world, thanks to people like Gordon Bell and Gwen Bell, who was really some of the founders over 25 years ago. And since then, we've got a tremendous board of trustees, Len Schustick, where Len is sitting. Our, where are you, Len? Right over here, chairman of the board. Uh, Grant Severs is one of our trustees. Who else? We had John Schock, John Mashey, the Johns back, back there. Uh, Ike Nassi is here, I believe, somewhere. Ike, right? And who else did I miss? Anyone else? So we're going to try to do this fall to really get up close and personal to meet some of the people, not only myself and the staff, David Miller, the VP of Development in the back, Karen Matthews, our Executive Vice President, uh, Mike Williams, okay, our Head Curator, and these are people that I hope you get to know, Pam Cleveland, who really is the Events Coordinator, that really helps put all these things together. So get to know us and get to know our collection, because it's artifacts, it's software, it's hardware, it's networking components, films, videotapes, this videotape that we make this evening becomes part of our collection. And that becomes part of what we want to do in our permanent home to be able to parlay what we want to be able to make really visible to the, in the public presence. One simple example of what our visible storage kind of looks like for those of you that haven't been there, uh, I guarantee things change. They come in and out every time I walk in there. I'm not really sure what to find next. Um, it's an exciting prospect. Uh, the PC wall, some of the more modern stuff, and we have dose and lead tours Wednesdays and Fridays at 1 o'clock and the first and third Saturdays of the month. And we'll be increasing the, the public presence and hours as time goes by. We spend a lot of time on, on exhibit design. Uh, it's part of the process of, you know, what is important overall and how do you put it all together to make a curated process and what's going to be important headlines of the future. Um, this is just one example of how you might display the, the 1620, which is one of the machines that we had a team of volunteers completely restore to working condition. Uh, just one of many of the wonderful volunteers, many of you that are here this evening, to really make a difference for a home operation. We've got a little mock-up of what part of our exhibit area might start to look like, kind of like the timeline of history. It won't look exactly like this. We debate this and change it every five minutes and ten minutes. Uh, uh, as we go through the curation process, but there's some really some serious thought given, and that's we want to invite all of you to come help us determine what's really important. And those stories become really exciting when you put that more information in our cyber museum over time. Our permanent home is a really exciting process as well. Uh, we our program plan really we figured we needed about 120,000 square feet and a minimum of about three acres, a minimum, believe me. Uh, and we're finishing up our schematic design. We really have this concept of a beta museum. Uh, in other words, we're going to move in from what we are now into something that's incrementally will grow for a while before we really unveil everything. And we're evaluating our opportunities because of the time. And of course, we're always in fundraising mode. 
We're part of NASA Research Park as a partner, as one of our options. We actually have two options now at, uh, in Mountain View. Some of you uh, we've told you about. We're, we're looking at some property nearby, right at Shoreline and 101. And we'll, we'll be able to tell you more about that in a couple of months if, if things work out. And we also now have our museum store sort of online. So go to our website. There's a lot of educational materials. That's going to be expanding in the future. And of course, you know, as we have out and back, the local apparel. But, uh, and that will continue to grow, just to show who we are and where we're going. So let me wrap up with, you know, really need your help to spread the word about us. Um, it's always a challenge to, to get the word out because we're growing, we're moving, a lot of things have been happening. Uh, volunteers are a tremendous way to get engaged with us. We're looking for docents. We've got a great docent program beginning. We've, I'm continually recruiting. Mike Williams got a program he's putting together, so we're getting more and more people. That'll help us become more public, as well as help us in those little things you've got in your garages. Let us know if, uh, before you throw them out, because they can be really, really valuable to tell us all the stories that we want to be able to project to our public. And of course, you know, become a supporter tonight, if you can. Um, it runs on the goodwill and philanthropy of some very generous in individuals and lots and lots of people. And uh, we need your help and support in every way possible. So with that, let me, let me introduce uh, Grant Severs, who just so happens to be very much engaged in the disc business himself in years past. Uh, he's former CEO of Adaptech. Uh, but more fundamentally, I want you to understand what it's like to be a trustee at the Computer History Museum. <laughs> Grant is not only a trustee, he's a member of the executive committee. He's chairman of the building committee. And, and I, I can't tell you how much I should really characterize him as a real, real volunteer. We have volunteer days every month. Grant probably only missed one or two. Uh, and when you need him, he's always there. So Grant, let me turn it over to you. And you want to say a few words, then introduce Al. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, I first met Al Shugard in 1970 when he was uh, Vice President of Engineering at Memorex Corporation. Probably an interesting story there because he brought, a, uh, I think, a few hundred engineers to Memorex from IBM. Um, the real beginning of the disk drive business other than what was IBM before. Uh, Al had established a pretty firm reputation by that time. He was in at the beginning, uh, right in the beginning of the disk drive business, uh, shortly after he joined IBM, and a participant in the development of 1301 and 2321, uh, a disk drive and a, something else called a data cell, respectively. Um, Al had developed quite a reputation as a work hard, play hard, tell you what you think, or tell you what he thought, an irrever irreverent kind of guy. Well, I got my first introduction when I walked into his office at Memorex. I'd flown to Memorex from Boston, where I was working for DEC. Uh, shook hands with Al. Uh, he picked up his golf clubs and walked out saying, I've got an important golf date. My guys will take care of you. So that was my first introduction. <laughs> the play hard part was clearly validated. Uh, sometime later, 1980, uh, DEC became the first customer of Seagate, and we put the uh, Seagate five and, five and a quarter inch, five megabyte hard drive in the Rainbow computer. How many people know what a Rainbow computer is? Ah, okay, so this, this joke will not be missed then. Well, we uh, can probably take credit for helping uh, Seagate succeed as their first customer. Probably that's the Rainbow's greatest contribution to the history of computing. <laughs> Well, I uh, followed Seagate closely as they were supplier to DEC, and uh, about 1985, uh, Seagate had a quarter in which they shipped twice as many disk drives as the quarter before, unfortunately at, at half the price of the quarter before. Now, for those of you who know something about manufacturing companies, this is just an awesome challenge. And of course, what stunned me, and I think stunned many people in the industry, they made a profit that quarter which is really a demonstration of Al's uh, ability to lead a major company and work hard. Well, the irreverent part of it, uh, you, uh, you might think that running your dog Ernest for Congress is irreverent, but of course I think that depends on your view of politics and politicians. Uh, Al was named the most admired 
man in the storage business for six consecutive years. And I remember a um, conference about 1995. I was sitting at the table with Al in the front of the ballroom at the uh, Fairmont Hotel down here. And uh, Chuck Haggerty, then CEO of Western Digital, which was a head-to-head -head competitor of Seagate, and Al was running Seagate at the time as CEO there, was giving the keynote speech. And he was extolling the virtues of his company as a virtual integration company, as a you know, virtual company. That was a big buzzword in companies about that time. That was, I think, really positioning Western Digital as a different company than Seagate, which was very heavily uh, vertically integrated. Well, about 20 minutes into Chuck Haggerty's keynote speech, 400 people out there in the Fairmont main ballroom, Al stands up and he says, Chuck, I have never heard such a load of crap in my whole life. <laughs> and walked out. <laughs> so he tells you what he thinks, as well as being irreverent. So it's my great pleasure to introduce the man who has been the most admired in the storage business for a long time, uh, certainly one of the key contributors of making computers what they are today through the disk drive contributions he's made and the companies he's led, Al Shugart. Thank you. Thank you, Grant. Earlier this year when I uh, told Julie Still, who's the communications vice president at Seagate, that I was going to give a talk on disk drive history. Yeah, I still talk to a few Seagate people. Uh, she said, you did that before, sometime in the 80s with a little philosophy thrown in. I thought, hell, history doesn't change, and uh, I really like, really enjoy philosophy, so I think I'll give the same talk again. Why don't you send it to me? So she sent it to me, and uh, with perhaps some minor changes, that's what you're going to hear tonight. My, she said it was given in the 1980s, but my assistant, Karen Seifert, and I discovered the talk was actually given in early 1992. But in any case, uh, you'll have to keep in mind that it was some time ago. And my comments are often reflective of what was going on in the world at that time. I came into the computer industry quite by accident. Um, I graduated from the University of Redlands in Southern California in 1951 after uh, four years and four different majors. I took a job with the IBM company in Santa Monica, California as a customer engineer. That's, that's a field engineer nowadays. And I did that because I could start the day after I graduated. I graduated June 10th and started June 11th. I, I was 20 years old, married with one kid, and dead broke. So I had to start to work. And I learned my first week at IBM that IBM field engineers were the lowest on the totem pole. I knew this when a field engineer in the office was promoted to salesman. <laughs> I'll never forget that early lesson, and I've held it against salesmen ever since. And after four years of having fixed all the troubles one could have with punch card accounting machines, in 1955, about the time when Scott McNeely was born, uh, I transferred to a small IBM R&D lab in San Jose. And uh, one of my earlier recollections of this IBM lab at 99 Notre Dame Street in San Jose was watching Don Johnson, one of the pioneers in disk development, pouring iron oxide paint onto a rotating 24-inch disk from a Dixie cup. No clean room, no equipment. The equipment was so crude, the Dixie cup didn't look out of place. And I certainly had no idea I was walking into the beginning of a technology and a product development program that would have such a profound impact upon the entire computer industry. Uh, Don Johnson was also one of the early disk drive entrepreneurs, having been a founder of IOMEC in, in 1968, I believe. IOMEC didn't make it, and I don't know where Don is now. Well, this pouring of iron paint on a 24-inch disk was going on at the small IBM R&D lab in San Jose, about 50 people strong. And the project was a source recording project directed towards solving all the problems of manual tub card files, tab card tub files. Uh, we were going to store data on these disks, and it was difficult to accept that we would actually be able to magnetically record 2,000 bits per square inch. That was 100 bits per inch, 20 tracks per inch. Boy, what an achievement. And by the way, of these 50 people at the Research and Development Lab, I think only about 15 or so 
We're working on this magnetic disk project, which included an entire system, including the computer, by the way. Nowadays, small disk drive startups have a lot more people. Anyway, the plan was that 50 of these 24-inch disks were to be stacked on a vertical shaft, providing a disk drive with 5 million characters of random access storage, weighing about a ton. We discarded the original approach of a horizontal shaft, well, which was the first model, by the way, and the reason was that we saw a potential need for multiple access stations uh, around the perimeter of the disk drive, and it made it a little difficult if the shaft were horizontal. Maximum access time was about a half a second, 500 milliseconds. The rotation speed of this drive was a very fast 1,200 RPM. It was a fixed record machine, five 100 character records per track. I keep referring to characters uh, since this was prior to the 8-bit byte. A character consisted of six data bits and a parity bit, so uh, each character always had an odd number of bits. No fire code, no ECC, no address marks, no flags for spare tracks. It should have made the controller really easy, but it didn't. We didn't even know how to clock data without a clock track. Clock track. Probably few of you even know what a clock track is. <laughs> and by the way, the electronics were all in vacuum tubes. There was no library of semiconductors to choose from. So every time uh, you needed another circuit, you had to design it from scratch using your vacuum tube handbook. And uh, magnetic head technology was equally crude. The, the air bearing that separates the head from the disc was created by externally supplied air routed through tiny orifices in the head carrier, which was loaded by air pressure from the same air supply. And the external air supply requirements were big show off. <laughs> what is this anyway? This is my airhead. <laughs> it is. It's an airhead. Uh, the external air supply requirements were so extreme that it was impractical to provide for more than two heads for the entire 100 disk services. Therefore, when accessing from uh, one disk to another, the two heads were unloaded and removed horizontally from the stack of disks, moved vertically to the desire, desired disk, and then horizontally to the desired track, and then loaded again. And if all that sounds complicated, let me tell you, it was. But it worked pretty well for that day and age. The disk drive rented. The disk drive itself rented for $750 a month. That doesn't include the air compressor. That costs another 150 bucks a month. And those are 1950 kinds of dollars. I believe IBM built nearly 5,000 of these disk drives, most of them being used in a system called RAMAC, Random Access Method of Accounting and Control. We wanted to call the thing RAM, but a fellow named Potter from the Potter Instrument Company had already used the name in a RAM in a product. There may be people here who remember Mr. Potter and the Potter RAM. I don't know. But probably none here has heard of Bill Goddard. Bill Goddard was awarded the Fundamental RAM Act patent, assigned to IBM, and received a belated cash award for his efforts. I guess that makes Bill Goddard sort of the grandfather of the industry, deserves all the recognition he can get. This demonstration of practical random access storage was the first of what I consider to be five major events in the disk drive evolution. Uh, during the early production years of the RAMAC drive, about the time that the president of a small computer company in Maynard, Massachusetts, was being selected as Young Engineer of the Year, that was Ken Olson, president of DEC, in case you didn't guess. I knew you got that, Gordon. The very old principle of a gas lubricated bearing was being better understood in the new IBM Research Center in San Jose. A set of technical articles describing the use of this bearing in magnetic recording appeared in the IBM Journal of Research and Development in 1958. And these articles became the Bible of a new segment of the computer industry, disk drives. The self-acting or slider bearing eliminated the need for an external air supply and now permitted for the first time a magnetic head to be put on each disk surface of a drive. This was the second major event in the disk drive evolution and of all the achievements over the years, this was probably the most significant. Well, there were several senior scientists contributing to these articles, which became the Bible for the industry. There were four young engineers who really did the brunt of the experimental work and deserved most of the credit. 
Jack Harker, Al Osterlin, Russ Bruner, and Ken Houghton. Uh, Jack Harker served a tour of duty as the IBM San Jose lab manager, and now I believe is retired. I don't know where Al Osterlin is. So Russ Bruner became a member of the Dirty Dozen, who founded Information Storage Systems, ISS, one of the first disk drive startups spawned from IBM. And Ken Houghton became Dean of Engineering at uh, Santa Clara University, and is now consulting and serving on several corporate boards, including Seagate, I believe. And with this big breakthrough in disk drive technology, IBM introduced another 24-inch disk drive called the Advanced Disk File, or ADF, type number 1301 which was physically about the same size as the original RAMAC drive, but stored 50 billion bytes of data instead of five. Now we've come to the byte. Without the need to move the magnetic heads from one disk to another, the average access time was reduced to just under 200 milliseconds. The recording density increased to 535 bits per inch at a track density of 50 tracks per inch, or 26,500 bits per square inch, an order of magnitude 10 times more than the original RAMAC drive. And at this point in time, with the help of the previously mentioned air-bearing Bible published by IBM, uh, disk drive competitors began to appear. Telex and Bryant are the first two I can recall. I visited both these companies and remember that I was impressed that they had gone as far as they had because it was not an easy project. I believe that Telex disk activity was eventually sold to data products and, and I don't know what happened to it after that. Bryant was a division of Excello Corporation which made machines that formed cardboard milk cartons, if you can believe that. I don't recall what happened to the Bryant disk drive division. The Telex drive used 24-inch disks on a vertical shaft, but had individual solenoids for accessing each head pair. The Bryant drive had big disks, 36 inches, I believe, and very thick. Disks were mounted on a horizontal shaft, and the entire bank of heads were positioned with a hydraulic actuator. And the reason is because Excello had a hydraulic actuator gauge division uh, in their company. I can also call, recall that while IBM was betting their marbles on disk drives, Univac made the conscious decision to pursue their fast strand series of magnetic drums instead of disk storage. Boy, I'm glad I didn't make that Univac decision. But what the heck, Univac uh, never believed in the 80 column card either. Or perhaps you don't remember the Univac 90 column card with round holes. Or for that matter, perhaps you don't even remember the IBM 80 column standard card either. <laughs> but the first disk drive with a head on each surface didn't come easy. We stumbled several times along the way, including making the recording disks out of thin sheet steel instead of aluminum, oxidizing the surface to obtain magnetic properties, and then sandwiching, uh, <clears throat> and sandwiching the two thin platters around aluminum honeycomb to get the structural rigidity and flatness, and they worked fairly well. But there were thousands of flaws. We could never get the surface good enough for practical use. And then we built some probe heads and tried to do vertical recording on these steel disks. And we, just, we uh, discovered a glue with temperature characteristics perfect for mating the magnetic head element to the magnetic carrying shoe. Well, the probe heads didn't work at all, and the perfect glue turned out to be water soluble at 150 degrees Fahrenheit. A lot of fun in development those days. We had lots of interesting projects in those days. Two of them come in mind. Both of these projects were run by Ray Herrera. Uh, one of the projects was called Project Rusty Nail because one day I asked Ray, what was the cheapest way to make a magnetic head? And he said, wrapping a piece of wire around a rusty nail. And I said, let's try it. And we did. I don't recall the outcome of that project. We had another project that we called Project Beer Can, and the concept was to get a very, very inexpensive small magnetic drum. We noticed in the beer industry they were just starting to extrude aluminum beer cans, and the surface looked really, really good. So we ordered several cases of beer cans and coated some and tried to record on them. I don't recall the conclusion of that project either. Biggest problem was, the biggest problem was getting IBM purchasing to order the beer cans. That was a real problem. Anyway, this was in the early 1960s when IBM's first disk drive with slider bearings was in, uh, bearing heads was in initial production. At that point in time, the third major disk drive event happened, and that was the removable disk pack. The removable disk pack was born, and the disk size was now 14 inches instead of 24, starting first with the 1311 with about 3.5 million bytes 
The 2311 with seven and a half million bytes per pack became an industry standard, and 14-inch discs were here to stay, at least for a long time. The 2311 was quickly followed with the 2314 with a storage capacity of 29 million bytes per pack. The recording density of the 2314 was 220,000 bits per square inch, an improvement of nearly two orders of magnitude over the early RAMAC drive. The guys who deserve the credit for this third breakthrough of the disc pack uh, were Jack Harker. I talked about him earlier as an author of the Bible. And uh, Ken Folger, a market planner who had the foresight and conviction to carry a new concept to success. I think both of these people were handsomely rewarded for their efforts on the first disc pack drive and deserve all the credit they can get. The 2311 and 2314 disc pack markets dramatically exceeded everyone's predictions, causing the beginning of disc drive plug compatible companies. The early ones that come to mind are Memorex, Century, Marshall, ISS, Kalos, and there were a whole bunch of other ones. I think uh, Jim Porter tells me there's 200 or something like that. The basic technology begun with the 24 inch disc on the 1301 continued through the IBM 3330 and a recording density of about one and a half million bits per square inch was achieved. At that point the technology was running out of gas and the fourth major event occurred and that was introduction of the low mass low load head. This recording system became known by all as Winchester technology and resulted in a recording density increase to an incredible 7.8 million bits per square inch, as seen on the IBM 3370 at that time. And now to over, and keep in mind this is 1992, and now to over 100 million bits per square inch. It's a lot more than that right now. Keep in mind, I said uh, this is in early 1992. Compare this with the 2,000 bits per square inch of the original RAMAC drive recording density had increased by a factor of 50,000 times. Truly 35 years of progress. Uh, Ken Houghton was the Winchester program manager, also one of the authors of the Bible. But Don Johnson, the disc painter, did the fundamental media interface work several years earlier. They both deserve a lot of credit. But really it all started with a non-IBM guy named Armin Miller. Armin Miller had a little head per track disc drive company in the valley here in the early days called Datadesk. And I think he really did the first low mass, slightly loaded head work. IBM bought a license for his technology. I think IBM paid him only about $40,000 for this. What a deal. Datadisk went through a name change and then was bought by Datapoint. And I don't know where Armin Miller is. And Datapoint, I don't think, is in the disk drive business any longer. But that was Winchester technology. If that were the whole story of disk drives, though, I wouldn't be here tonight. The missing piece is the floppy disk drive, the fifth major event. The floppy disk was actually a uh, result of advances in semiconductor technology. This may sound strange to you, so let me explain. In the early 1960s, with IBM's introduction of the System 360, microcode and control memory was employed to a large extent in both CPUs and in peripheral controllers. The control storage was implemented in capacitor and transformer read-only memory, since magnetic core and semiconductor memories were much too expensive. This was early, uh, in the early 60s. When the IBM System 370 was introduced a few years later, with the same basic architecture as the System 360, semiconductor technology had now advanced to a point that control storage could be implemented with semiconductors. And a machine-writable control memory solved a lot of engineering change, logistic problems that we discovered with control memory implementation in the System 360. However, since the semiconductor memory was volatile, a control memory load device was required. And although magnetic tape could certainly do the job, the capability of random access storage prompted the development of the floppy disk. An economical program load device that not only loaded the control program, but also diagnostics as required. And control programs were easy to change just by slipping in a new floppy disk. It was but a short step for the desirability of logging on the same device to result in the addition of a write capability. And lo and behold, a small, inexpensive, random access storage device that would provide for an absolute market explosion for small systems, as well as the demise of the punch card for data entry. I'm sure you're all aware of that explosion. 
There are probably 17 guys in the world who take credit for the floppy, but only three come to mind. Uh, the first is Dave Noble. He was the floppy disk program manager at IBM and is the real father of floppy disks in my judgment. That was Dave Noble. And the other two people I recall as being instrumental were Herb Thompson and Ralph Flores. They discovered the cleaning jacket that housed the media. The problem was with this first floppy disk, the dust particles on the diskette uh, made it very difficult to get reliable recording. So Ralph and uh, and Ralph, Herb Thompson and Ralph Flores discovered this cleaning jacket, permanent cleaning jacket, where the disc would rotate within this cleaning jacket. Uh, the, I don't think the floppy would be here today without that invention. Herb was one of the founders of Sugar Associates, by the way. I'm not, and then he founded Drive Tech. I don't know what he's doing now. I'm not sure where Ralph Flores is. And I think everything else we've done since then has just been the result of market opportunity. The staggering number of users and suppliers of systems has resulted in new applications, as well as expansion of existing applications. This snowballs as last year's applications expand, and this year brings new applications. And what do these new applications and expansion mean? It means a requirement for more and more memory. What a great business to be in, and I believe the disk drive industry is in its infancy, as it has been for 35 years. This is 1992, don't forget. But the floppy disk wasn't the only key element in the small computer explosion. It took Altair Computer and the CPM operating system from digital research to show everyone the true potential. Everybody remembers Steve Jobs and Apple. Very few remember Gary Kildall and digital research. I was lucky to have played a role in those early days of floppies at Shugart Associates and then a much longer lived role at Seagate starting several years later. In fact, the beginning of Seagate is sort of interesting, so I'd like to tell you about it. In, uh, in late September of 1979, I, I hadn't been working very hard for five years. I owned a bar and was doing some salmon fishing. Uh, the desktop computer market was going bananas, and I could have cared less. Millions of units were being shipped annually, and most of them had a small auxiliary memory device called a mini floppy disk drive. These mini floppies were a reduced size version of the original floppy, 8 inch floppy drive. I've been working around computers and disk drive memories for over 25 years and have discovered one fundamental that transcends computer systems of all size. That is, a computer system's appetite for memory is insatiable. That was and is true for even small computers. As more and more applications were put on these systems, the memory requirements grew. And in late 1979, these additional memory requirements were being made by adding a second, third, and fourth mini floppy disk drive. So Finus Connor, one of the founders with me at Shugart Associates, came to me in late September of 79 with the idea, idea to uh, build a fixed rigid disk drive, the same physical size as the mini floppy, five and a quarter inch, with higher performance and higher reliability and with 15 times the storage capacity at three times the cost. He said that if that were possible, he could sell to every desktop computer manufacturer that was shipping systems with more than one mini-floppy. That is, our device would fill the memory need for more than one mini-floppy. I thought this was possible. I looked at technically, and we decided to go into business. On October 1st, 1979, Finance and I hacked out an eight-page business plan, a total plan, eight pages. And that predicted us nearly taking over the world and very quickly. It was, a, it was a very, very aggressive plan. It had to be. Finest and I had both run out of money, and we needed to be recapitalized. Now all we needed was some key people, money, a disc, and a facility. Each of us kicked in ten grand, 10000 bucks, and hit the road with our plan. We found a mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, an operations manager very quickly. It seems get-rich schemes are easy to sell to poor people. We, uh, <laughs> we decided to let my daughter keep the book. She was going to college, and... and, and uh, she worked cheap so we could afford her. And finding the money to finance the venture wasn't quite that easy. We reasoned that our idea was worth $2 million and that we would sell 25% of our plan for 500000 Our first stop was the Page Mill Group, a venture capital group made up of very successful people from the electronics industry. They would be sure to see the wisdom of what we're doing. Bob Noyce, Lester Hogan, John Young, Ken Oshman, several other equally famous and successful people. And after my presentation, John Young, who, if you don't know, was the president of Hewlett-Packard, said, Al, why should we pay 
a half a million dollars for only 25% of a company. That's only an idea in the minds of you and Finus. And I said, John, perhaps you shouldn't. And they didn't. <laughs> We're walking out of the car and Finus says, uh, Al, I think you need to brush up on your marketing technique. <laughs> but Finus and I, this is a, that's a true story. Finus and I decided that perhaps they didn't have enough money, so we set our sights on bigger bucks. We knew that the Exxon Corporation made venture investments, and that, cor that corporation seemed to have a good balance sheet, a lot of cash. So we made an appointment with the Exxon guy in New York who handled that sort of thing and flew to New York. We arrived early in the evening. The day before the meeting, went out for a really nice dinner. We decided to celebrate the big deal we were going to close the next morning. So we got a bottle of really fine wine, inexpensive, too. When we returned to the hotel, there was a message from the Exxon guy that said he had to leave town. <laughs> the meeting was canceled. He would call us in a few weeks. That was an expensive sales call, I'll tell you. But we weren't discouraged. Following that, we got turned down by the Mayfield Fund, Idana Partners, and several funds didn't even return our calls. But we still weren't discouraged. Money wasn't the only thing we needed. We needed a disk. I'll explain that. In a rigid disk drive in those days, the data was magnetically recorded on an oxide-coated aluminum disk. And there was a great deal of technology and a lot of tooling money involved in producing magnetic disks. We needed a commitment from a magnetic disk manufacturer to develop and manufacture a disk that was a different physical size from any in the industry. It would require a manufacturer to not only spend a lot of money on developing the disk, but an even greater amount in tooling for production. The total dollar requirement made our requirement seem awfully small. So first, we flew to Minneapolis to see the 3M Corporation. The 3M people were very interested in the project, but they couldn't do anything. They thought our schedule was totally inconsistent with their view of reality. But they were really nice people and agreed to help our effort to get the company off the ground by cutting down some larger disks to the required five and a quarter inch size we needed. And even though the center hole of the disk was larger than we could tolerate, the disk could serve as a good visual aid. While we were waiting for the 3M sample disks, we called on Memorax, but they never called us back. Within several days, 3M hand delivered six disk samples to me in California just to help us out. With the disk samples in hand, we called on Norm Dion, president of Dysan Corporation in Santa Clara, a magnetic disk net manufacturer. I handed Norm one of these five and a quarter inch samples, and he held it and stared at it. It seemed like an hour, but it was probably a few seconds. Dysan was just getting into production on an eight inch disk, having manufactured 14 inch disks for several years. Finally, Norm said, you know, eight inches is the wrong size. I figured we had him at that point. He saw the tremendous future of what we wanted to do and agreed on the spot to develop and manufacture the five and a quarter inch disc. Then he asked us how we're doing on getting financed. And not showing, wanting to show any weakness, I told him we expected to close something any day. I'm trying to keep my voice from cracking. <laughs> he said that was a shame since he thought it would make a good package for Dysand to fund our development effort as well as commit to the disc. And we quickly saw the wisdom in that. <laughs> And on, on November 14th, 1979, six weeks after we put our plan together, Norm Dion gave me a check for $500,000. Uh, here was the deal. He wanted 51% of the company for his $500,000, but he also would agree to manufacture, tool and uh, develop and manufacture the disc. He also would make $500,000 available for the loans if we needed money until before we got additional venture capital. We told him he had to reduce his 51% to 49%, which didn't make any difference, but he agreed, and so he got 49% of the company for half a million. Out of the $500,000 that he made available to borrow, I did borrow, we did borrow $300, no, $35,000 of me to payroll. We'd always planned to get the lawyers to document the deal because Norm and I just signed the thing uh, and, and, and shook hands. Uh, I would say we didn't sign anything, we just shook hands. We'd always planned to get the lawyers to document the deal, but we never got around to it. It wasn't necessary. I mean, I knew what the deal was. He knew what the deal was. That is, until we raised a million dollars of venture capital the following June. Now, venture capitalists don't like handshakes, so before they would give us money, we had to document the deal. Document the deal. Uh, by that time, we'd already spent the money anyway. The total venture capital put into Seagate was only one and a half million dollars. The first half million was Norm. Uh, Reed Dennis is here tonight. He's uh, 
with, uh, IVP was one of the venture capitalists who put in a half a million, and Oak Investment Partners put in a half a million. I got to tell you this story. Uh, Ed Grassmeyer from Oak and, and Reed each agreed to put in a million bucks and gave us a term sheet, two million dollars, and we didn't like the terms. There were some some uh, negative covenants that we said got to be removed, and they they both said okay. Take the negative covenants out, but instead of the $2 million, you only get $1 million, half a million from each of us. And we said, okay. So we took a half a million for each. So that's why there was only $1.5 million of venture capital. Reed, I think that little deal cost you about $20 million bucks, but I'm not sure. 50? 50? <laughs> about the same time we shook hands with Dice we found our second believer in all places, Scotts Valley, a local contractor, the Seckle Development Corporation, read our plan and decided we could do it. He agreed to put a second floor over his office area to get us going and do it in two weeks, build a lab and some storage space downstairs and start construction of a 32,000 square foot permanent facility in the same part. We moved into our office space and started design effort on December 1st, eight weeks from the time we put our plan together. Funny thing occurred to me when I realized that I'm on Xerox ground today. I've never been on Xerox ground before. When we started Seagate, we called it Shugart Technology on purpose. We knew we were going to have to change it because Xerox owned Shugart Associates at the time, and they had Shugart Corporation, Shugart this and that. We said, well, let's call it Shugart Technology, uh, and uh, wait till Xerox sues us. We'll get a lot of publicity, and then we'll change our name. They can't get any, they can't get any money from us because we don't have anything. So we waited and waited and waited with Shugart. They never sued us. And we were getting ready to ship, and so we had to change the name, get the real name. And so I went through the dictionary, and I was looking for a seven-letter word, uh, looking at Shugar, looking at a seven-letter word that started with an S, ended with a T, and had a G in the middle. And the only thing I could come up with, and it wasn't even a word, was Seagate. And it's two words. It's, it's hyphenated. But I took the hyphen out, and, and Seagate uh, was, and I showed it to Finus, and he thought it was a good idea. And so we went, went ahead with Seagate. And so we went through all the legal proceedings of changing our name from Shugart Technology to Seagate Technology. And the week after we changed our names, we got a letter from Xerox. They were going to sue us. Too late! <laughs> what a dirty trick. This is, anyway, I thought I'd bring that up. This is the first time I've been on a Xerox, in a Xerox facility. Uh, we needed to... Uh, Get order. We, get, we need to get some parts on order. We needed to get magnetic heads on order quickly. So we called. I called the manufacturer's representative. I told him we wanted to buy a hundred thousand magnetic heads. At the time, this was about a two million dollar deal. He said he'd call on us. Where are we located? I said, Well, we're in Scotts Valley. He'd never heard of it. I told him it was in Santa Cruz County, over the mountains from San Jose. I said, After you come out of the mountains on Highway 17, you turn on Santa's Village Road. Then you go, you go for a quarter mile and turn left at Leo's Liquors. <laughs> then you cross a little bridge and go to Sweet C and the only building there and we're upstairs. <laughs> so he repeats the directions. Let's see, now I turn off on Senate Village Road, left at Leo's Liquors, small bridge. Is that right? I said, yeah, that's right. And he says, and you want to buy 100,000 magnetic heads? <laughs> I expected any minute for him to say, come on now, who is this? But he didn't. And he came to see us, and he accepted the order. I don't even remember what's, who, what's the vendor was. But it was tough with vendors in those early days. We completed our product development in five and a half months. And we showed our product in a hotel suite at the National Computer Conference in Anaheim in May of 1980. Actually, we showed 20 units, all the die castings. We needed 20 because all of them didn't work all the time. Uh, we got orders during that show, including a $200,000 prepayment. And we, be, we began shipment six weeks later in July of 1980. We shipped 50 units our first month, and by October we were shipping 10 units a day out of a 1,000 square foot lab. Isn't that amazing? They sold for $1,500 each, 300 megabytes. Uh, that's $300 a megabyte. There's five megabyte drives for $1,500. I remember John Roach from uh, Radio Shack told me, uh, gee, $300, $300 a megabyte. Get that down to $100 a megabyte, and I'll buy all you could ever make. <laughs> you know what they are now? It's less than a penny a megabyte is what it is now, way less than a penny. In our first full operating year, we did about $12 million in revenue. We made $1.8 million of net profit. Profit margins never been that good since in the disk drive business. <laughs> 
Things went so fast that we had an initial public offering of our stock only 22 months from the, when we started on September 21st, uh, 1981. The low day of the stock market. September is always the, the bad month of the stock market. Uh, but th this was a low day of the year, September 21st. And that's the day we, our IPO went out. You read these things nowadays, uh, the public gets mad because these investment bankers are allocating IPO stock. They've been doing it all these years. I mean, we, used to, we gave the, the underwriters a list of uh, friends in the family, vendors and so forth, that we wanted to allocate IPO shares to. And I think that it's crazy. But that started my uh, learning on uh, public securities. Uh, the, the, key un the chief underwriter... The lead underwriter, I think our stock went out at twelve dollars a share, and he thought that it was going to that he was going to buy it back a lot less because September's a bad month. Well, it didn't. It went up, and he had to buy it back at fourteen and lost money. So and that's when I learned about selling short. Uh, but I really enjoyed learning about the secure, public security. In fact, I joined the NASD, National Association of Security Dealers Board of Governors. I was on it for three years. Uh, I really learned a lot. And a funny thing happened when Norm Dion of Dysan, who was on our board of directors, read the first draft of our prospectus and discovered that Seagate owed Dysan over $1 million for discs we never paid for. He checked with his finance people and discovered they hadn't pushed us because they thought we were a division of Dysan. <laughs> and Norm, Norm was really mad. He was really mad. But he cooled down when we paid him back out of the IPO proceeds with interest. Uh, truly entrepreneurs in the fast lane, and this is... But, one of the many great startups in the country, certainly Sun Microsystems, Cisco, and there's a lot more examples around here. But what really makes these great opportunities? The uh, availability of capital, certainly. But I really think it has more to do with changes in our society. Let me talk a little about that, and I'll quit. When I was working at IBM, the corporation organized a science advisory board made up of a group of very distinguished scientists from very distinguished universities. This group met periodically with IBM management and senior technical people to give us the benefit of their wisdom and learning. They held a meeting in San Jose, and I was lucky enough to have been invited. And following lunch, the IBM host asked the members of this advisory board if they would each comment on the terrible unrest that was going on in our universities and the apparent change in behavior of all our younger people. If you don't remember or weren't around at the time, the 1960s found a lot of our young people in jail for acts against the public policy. I recall one columnist writing that while driving down the road, he saw a sign that said, Free Firewood. And his immediate thought was, Who's this guy Firewood? Why is he in jail? You know? <laughs> anyway, each of, each of the six or so distinguished scientists addressed the subject. Uh, Norbert Weiner began and expressed great disappointment, disappointment in our youth with their erratic behavior and concluded that we were going downhill. The following speakers expressed the same disappointment and offered theories as to why the behavior and proposals for fixing it. The opinion was generally unanimous until the last distinguished scientist spoke. I can't recall his name, but I can picture him clearly. He was a world-renowned mathematician, long since retired from his position at Columbia University. And this quiet, elderly, gray-haired gentleman said that what was going on with our young people was the result of a change in society that had begun and that he was both pleased and excited about it. He mentioned individualism, opportunity, creativity, and a true thinking and nourishing society. He said we could close our eyes and not watch the change, or we could open our eyes and participate in the change, because it's going to change anyway. And he had no fear of the future. I thought at the time, easy for him to say, the old bugger's in his 80s, he won't be around when these young crazies are around. <laughs> but you know... The old guy was right, right on. We were seeing an expression of individualism as a result of a change in society that had begun and is still in process. We've moved from a mass industrial society to an information society with much more profound impact than the 19th century shift from an agricultural society to an industrial society. And I think a part of this change is a significant trend towards decentralization. We've moved to an age of the individual, whereas the uh, strategic resource in the industrial society was capital. The strategic resource in the post-industrial information society is knowledge and data. And that's not only renewable, but self-generating as well. And, then, and this, I believe, provides for the great entrepreneurial activity in the United States today. Because the strategic resource is now what we have in our heads. Access to the system is much easier. 
I believe that not only will we see an impressive increase in the creation of small businesses, but if large institutions are to survive, they'll restructure to encourage entrepreneurial activity within their institutions, and certainly in a decentralized environment, and they still may not survive. Just as the age of large department stores is over, I believe the age of large total range computer companies is over. For several years now, I've referred to IBM as the Macy's of the computer industry. And my thesis started to look better a month or so ago when Macy's declared bankruptcy. This is where Karen and I determined the speech was given in early 1992 because Macy's declared bankruptcy in early 1992. In 1950, 65% of the people in the country were working in the industrial se sector, 65% and only 17% in the information sector. Today, I believe those percentages are nearly reversed. The number one occupa occupation in the country today is clerk, replacing labor and farmer before that. Farmer, labor, clerk, a brief history of the United States. You might want to contemplate what will come after clerk. It's been suggested that it will be either soldier or poet, and I'm not sure which one I'd bet on. And this age of the individual has brought decentralization. We see large airlines collapsing while new local and regional airlines are beginning. Large general purpose instrumentalities are not in tune with the times. We see large circulation general purpose magazines folding while thousands of special interest magazines are being published. We see a great umbrella organization like the American Medical Association getting weaker as the groups within it, the pediatricians, surgeons, etc., are getting stronger. We now have more people contributing to special interest groups like Save the Whales than contribute to the umbrella Democratic and Republican parties combined. I think the two great American political parties now exist in name only. We have a Congress filled with independents, yet still needing money from their party, so they've got to maintain their party affiliation. I think we'll see new political parties organized, but they'll be more regional than national. We see local consensus being sought on questions that have never been brought to the political process before. There have been many votes on where we can and can't smoke, using or not using public funds for abortion, uh, whether we should continue to recognize South Africa. Some time ago, down in Long Beach, they voted on whether or not to have an oil tanker terminal, and uh, later on, the color of their street lights. We never voted on those kinds of things before. It's part of what the political scientists would call direct democracy. But I see it as decentralization and a part of the change in society that's led to a great number of opportunities for new leaders today. This great new age of individualism and special interest groups has also found a lot of jobs for a lot of lawyers. These, these lawyers are misusing our legal system. But that's another story for another time. Entrepreneurs are leaders. And followers make leaders, not the reverse. And in the old Taoist model of leadership, find a parade and get in front of it. In this new decentralized information society, our entrepreneurs are finding much smaller parades, but a lot more of them. And boy, do I like parades. Now, if you'd like to any of my opinions updated, since that was 10 years ago, or have some questions about more recent events, I'd be happy to respond. Um, I hope this wasn't a lecture. I hate the word lecture. My two best friends don't like lecture. My new two best friends are dogs, by the way, Moses and Sophie. I can talk to them, but I can't lecture them. So I hope this wasn't a lecture. So anyway, if uh, any questions or want anything updated? Jim Porter. Al, back in 69, uh, when I happened to be at Memorex, and you arrived with a whole bunch of folks from IBM, there was always a lot of questions about exactly how many people you brought with you. How many was it, Al? <laughs> the question was, how many people did I bring from IBM? I don't know. I got sued for that, and I don't recall. I, I, think, it's, uh, I, don't, I think the problem is in, def in, in defining whether I brought somebody or not. I don't think I brought more than a half a dozen, but there were probably 300. <laughs> Henry Gladney, I used to be an IBM, and I even used to be Manny Peori's gopher on the Science Advisory Committee. Let me suggest that the mathematician you couldn't remember is probably Richard Courant, the Courant Institute at New York University, not Columbia. Oh, could have, could have been. See, I'll be the first mistake I've ever made. <laughs> Thank you. It could have been. Oh. I remember what he looks like, this little guy with gray hair. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Now, 
Yeah. So nothing of significance is the floppy of the Winchester? Surely some things have happened. Oh, lots of significant things, but nothing fundamental. I mean, sure, we've had magneto-resistive heads and all this kind of stuff, but there have been there were a lot of things within the time period I was talking about that were significant, but not fundamental things like the five I mentioned. No, there haven't been. I don't believe. Yeah. Did the earliest targets you were talking about even have boot sectors or anything like that? Didn't hear. Please question. Oh. Repeat. <laughs> did the did those early hard drives you were talking about even have boot sectors? Which sectors? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh. <laughs> what's, what's he talking about, Grant? I think I think the answer is no. I don't think the early drives had boot sectors. That was all done in the BIOS and the in the PCs. Uh, now, some system makers added that stuff in their controllers. They weren't really in the drives. Okay. That sounds like something unnecessary for me to know. <laughs> You had a question, Grant. Yeah. Um, certainly, I think lots of folks looked at, and at least I did, looked at the disk business as one of the tougher technologies given its breadth and depth of multi-technologies and pretty capital intensive, at least in the early days. Um, and, and it progressed much faster than Moore's Law over the past 50 years, uh, 60 to 100 percent per year. Uh, when you look at all that, how do you really justify or explain the fact that this drive companies have single-digit gross margins, let alone you know <laughs> one or two percent profits. What what about the business uh, caused that to happen? Why did the disk drive companies why did they uh, run out of profit margin earlier than earlier than other companies? I'm not I'm not really sure. Maybe just stupid. I'm not sure. Uh, my my plan at Seagate before I got fired. Maybe that's why I got fired. I don't know. I thought that you can't make money in the disk drive business. You have to go up. You have to go up the food chain, and you've got to be in the systems business, just like you can't make money just in the magnetic head business. And uh, it may just be a fact of life that the profit margins, if you're on disk drives, are going to be down there. In order to make money on them, you have to be in the total systems business. I'm not sure, Grant. That's what I would suggest, though. We had somebody back in the corner. Uh, uh, IBM sold its major disk business to Hitachi for a bag of peanuts in the song. you have any comment on that? No, I don't know. But I, you know, I, I, when I got fired in July of 1998, I quit following the disk drive industry. So I'm not really sure why, what happened, or why. Uh, people have told me that the IBM uh, getting out of the disk drive business is strictly a, a function of the new CEO and not a function of uh, anything but that. The CEO thought that it would be easier for him to uh, make a better measure of his success without the disk drive business than it would be with. I, I just don't know. Can't tell you. In, in the intro, uh, there's a passing mention of the data cell, and I just wondered if you could give us a, a little bit of a riff of what the motivation for that was and how long believers in that motivation lasted. Talk about the data cell drive, the, the data cell drive, 400 megabyte drive. This was a strip drive, and uh, the only reason we did it, somebody research started it and we had to finish it. Uh, it was 400 megabytes, and uh, uh, cost of the older purpose in doing it was the cost per byte was much lower than uh, than disk technology. But you looked out in the future, there was absolutely, uh, it was absolutely going to run out of gas from a cost standpoint. And so I think there was only one version, the 2321 was it. But it was dead just because of a cost per bit thing. It was also pretty slow. But it was only done because uh, they it got started in research and the development guys wanted to finish it. <laughs> That's what happened. Al, just piggybacking on that question, how about the uh, NCR, uh, what was it, the CRAM machine or, uh, remember the ONCR, random access machine, CRAM card? Oh, or? yeah, the NCR, oh, I can't remember the name of it. It was a card machine, magnetic card machine. Yeah, what role did that play, if any? I don't even remember what that was called or what the, what the, the success of that or lack of success was and, and, uh, and why, I just don't know. CRAM, was card random access memory. I just don't remember what the uh, secret was. Can't help you. It was so long ago. Uh, Robert Garner. I was told a story by an ex-IBMer. Maybe uh, you could confirm or deny, possibly. It relates to the invention of the floppy disk drive. He told me that the manager of the program, when given this order of let's go you know, find something to load microcode with, went into an office supply store and saw a dictation machine. 
with a flexible medium and said, you know, make that work as a as a microcode disk drive in floppy disk. I'm not sure. Did you understand the question? Yeah. In other words, they saw a dictation machine, which has a floppy magnetic medium at the time, and said, let's just copy that. Instead of magnetic tape? Well, in, as the invention itself, in other words. Yeah, well, the problem was that, that there was too much uh, a system advantage over random access that the tape didn't have. That was the only reason. But, but I'm asking is, is did the inspiration come from a dictation machine seen in an office supply store? I don't know. I don't remember. Let's just have a couple more. Uh, you know, this goes back to uh, Finus uh, Connor doing Connor peripherals and then eventually Connor peripherals being acquired or reassorbed by uh, Seagate. And I wondered if you might comment on that just a little. Comment on? Well, just the history of how that all happened. Oh, how? Oh. Uh, when uh, Seagate bought Connor peripherals, that we were talking about, that was the period of time. Well, when they, you know, he, he left Seagate and started Connor, and then ten years later, um, Seagate, you know, bought Connor, you know, and merged. And I, I always thought that sequence of events was fascinating. Yeah, well, we went, uh, we went to see Connor to uh, not to buy his disk drive for it, but to buy he had a component. I think what was the component? Did he make disks? Was he making disks? Yeah, I think it was making disks. And we went to get the disk part of it. He says, why don't you buy the whole thing? I think that's how it evolved. We went to buy the disk part. And he suggested we buy it. I think that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah, I have a, a comment. Um, I don't know if you've read uh, the Gilda report on the StoreWith uh, conference, but uh, he talked about the aerial densities in disk drives up until the year 1992 and then pass that, and he said, compared to um, processor density and memory density, Moore's law uh, applied, which means that those densities doubled every 18 months, versus in the disk drive business, the aerial densities had increased on an average of 27%. However, since 1992, the aerial densities and disk drives have actually um, improved much more dramatically than Moore's law there's been a 1,500-fold increase in aerial density since 1992. So it seems there's been some pretty dramatic um, improvements in disk drive technology since 1992. Well, that's true, and I don't know that Moore's Law has any bearing on this at all. Uh, and I don't really know that much about what's happened since 1998, where most of this stuff has really happened. And that's also one of these things that I don't think I'm really interested in knowing anyway. I quit, quit, I really quit, lost interest in the disk drive business in July of 1998. I have a couple more, and then I got to, My dogs are waiting for me. <laughs> Some uh, technology innovators uh, are able to protect their margins and their businesses through patents. Others aren't able to, like IBM and Shugart Associates and Seagate. Can you comment on what the difference was in the disk drive industry that prevented you from insulating yourself from competition through the use of patents? I don't think anybody ever uh, was prevented or or cut their or had a margin problem because of intellectual property. I don't know of any. Give me a. I'll give you an example. Xerox isn't a good example today, but for many years, they made very handsome profits because they were able to exclude people from making copiers because of their patent protection. Rambus also isn't a good example today, but for a number of years, they were able to make money exclusively on their intellectual property. I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> you have to talk to the last guy that talked. <laughs> well, one more. I got to go. My dogs are waiting for me. One last one. Uh, you talked uh, earlier uh, about the decentralization, and I see – I'm here. Hello. <laughs> And I see there a market trend that there is a migration of security and data storage. And if you look at a few companies popping up there, which is like UltraCard, StoreCard, CapCard, LaserCard, where they all try to put data storage in a secure way into small form factors like smart cards. So what's your view on that? You must have me confused with somebody who cares and knows. Uh, uh, <laughs> 
I, I am not. I am not an expert in uh, in storage. Not, the, tonight's sto tonight's uh, message was had nothing to do with uh, with uh, uh, technology or what's happening, what's going to happen. All it had to do with what history. And all I wanted to give you some history. I want to leave you with one thing, though. Can I say one thing before you? Uh, I want. I ran across this yesterday, and I want to read it. To you. It's, it was written in the 1800s, and it's called Success, and it was Ralph Waldo Emerson. Ralph Waldo, in a short, Ralph Waldo Emerson says, To laugh often and much, to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children, to earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition. To know even one life has breathed easier because you live. This is to have succeeded. Isn't that good? That's Ralph Waldo Emerson. That's great. Okay. You've done that. You've done that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you. Oh. There you go, Al. They want a picture. Good picture? Yeah, come on over here. Come on over here. Come on over here. There you go.